episode 35 of the School Muscle with Broderick Chavez. Now, his expertise is more so in the enhanced realm. And while I think that there's still basic principles that can be applied to natural athletes, Broderick has some different thoughts on that. And Broderick didn't love all the questions I asked. But don't worry, we we still got a log. It was all good. But I hope you enjoy this episode with Broderick Chavez. So the first topic I'd like to discuss here with you, Broderick, is I was asked a question the other week, and it was about whether high protein massing instead of high carb massing might be beneficial. And the idea is that one benefit from high carb massing is that you might get a uh, a nice insulogenic, I don't know if that's a word or not, environment in the body that could be potentially beneficial for growing muscle. And that a high protein diet might accomplish this higher insulin environment as well, but potentially mitigate fat gain while massing. So I'd be interested in kind of what you might think about this. Um, it, It's certainly not a new concept. It's something that's been bantered about forever. Um, from a physiologic biochemistry point of view, doesn't make a drop of sense. Uh, people that parrot that apparently didn't pay attention in sixth and seventh grade biology, much less, you know, college level uh, cellular energetics. Cells run on ATP. At the end of the day, whatever you put in your face, your body is going to break down eventually into ATP via adenosine diphosphate and binding a free phosphate to it, creating the molecule known as ATP. Whether that's done through the Krebs cycle, the Cori cycle, the electron transfer chain, that's what happens. With that simple concept in mind, your body burns glu- converts glucose into ATP the easiest and with the least steps. Can you force your body to manufacture essentially glucose via protein? Absolutely, people do it all the time. But it's not the superior way to do that. If you pressed me for thoughts, my first thought would be (laughs) stupid. But my second thought would be the most likely reason that that system has any efficacy is because high protein foods very often are higher fat foods. And what it probably means is that people are just simply getting a greater calorie load and therefore meeting their goals. I don't have a problem with that, but don't lie to me and tell me it's because leucine releases as much insulin as glucose and the stupid shit that people make up and and or take out of context. The whole, again, clear your mind, boys and girls, the whole idea behind a ketogenic diet is you have very low insulin levels. You're eating protein, Where's the, where's the leucine? Where's the glu- st- stupid? I don't care if you want to eat a bunch of protein. I don't give a shit. But according to all the classes that I've attended in this lifetime, the body runs on glucose or at least runs the most efficiently on glucose. W- why reinvent the wheel? I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I feel like some people just like eating a lot of protein. Well, so. See- there's, but there's the thing. Let me be clear. First of all, there's a couple of things in there. One, like people <laughs> accuse me of being like the high carb guy. Like, n- no, it's just diet. That's the way diet works. I happen to be of large diet because I'm a large person. So, okay, <laughs> I'm high carb, but it's not because I have a love affair with carbohydrates that's the fuel that's like saying a truck driver is like a fan of diesel fuel. No, they just drive a lot. and Therefore, they buy a lot of goddamn diesel fuel. It's stupid to think of it any other way. So that's the first thing. The next thing is, I don't give a f- what you do. If you want to live on marshmallows, I don't give one f- I don't care. So this idea like that, that they want to contort the science to justify their desire, just say, I want to eat a bunch of steak. Then go eat the steak and let me to. I don't care. I don't care. You yeah. you rub steak all over your naked body. I don't give a. F- <laughs> it has nothing to do with me. You want the most efficient, effective diet? Come talk to me, and we'll probably wind up talking about carbohydrates. Second or third, 
maybe even fourth at this point. <laughs> I didn't I didn't attack you for it because I'm trying my best to be nicer. But you used the word mass, a high carb mass versus a high protein mass. You'll never hear that language come out of me. I don't use that wording. I believe that the whole spastic cyclical nation notion of, you know, gaining weight, losing weight, all these spastic iterations have gone out of, out of control. The whole purpose of bodybuilding from the beginning of your career to the end of your career is to accrue more muscle. So in my mind, there's never a moment when mass isn't your overriding objective. There may be times when leanness equates to it or maybe even outstrips it, but always the number one factor is mass because it's body building, B -b building. Mm -hmm. There's a building component. Right, but isn't there still, doesn't massing kind of imply increases in mass, whereas if why would your Why would your goal ever be otherwise? Even when you're dieting, your, your goal isn't to lower your muscle mass. Right, but it's... No, it's not semantics. You think I'm being silly. It's not semantics. A little bit. Like, no, it, it absolutely is not. A bodybuilder's goal from day one is to gain muscle and model it, modulate slash moderate body fat. Coming into contest time, a bodybuilder's goal is to maintain or accrue muscle mass and reduce body fat. They are two separate animals, but the mass one is always pointed in the upward direction. So there's never a, a no mass portion of bodybuilding. That's called, I don't know what that's called. Call CrossFit or something. I, it's <laughs> stupid. Okay, I I understand what you're saying, but I also think that most people kind of get my point when I'm saying massing. Well, I, I believe you and I agree with you, but keep in mind, most people listening to this are 160 pounds and will never compete in. Also true. I, I, again, I'm not trying to be mean or disparaging, but... I live in a rarefied world. I live in a world mm -hmm. of elite, world-class athletes, good genetics, good work ethic, good drug use, you know, good budgets. I live in a rarefied world, and we, me and my people, we don't look backwards. We don't have a no-mass period. That's, we don't do that. Right. You don't think I Ross Coleman was sitting around like, yeah, you know, I'm, a, I'm <laughs> on a shrinking diet or what? No, he was not. Well, I think the, the argument back to that would be that we're not all Ronnie Coleman and that we're not all in that and, situation. And, and once again, just like the meat, that's fine with me, mm -hmm. but I'm probably not the person they should be talking to. Right. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, and I try to be as forthright as possible. Mm -hmm. I think that makes a lot of sense. And for the, the population you work with, kind of the more elite lifters, do you still go through like massing? Okay. Do you still go through periods of where you focus on gaining a significant amount of weight and then trying to reduce body fat while either accruing a little bit less mass or? It winds up being a phasic approach, but with an entirely different mindset and therefore somewhat a different iteration. In a off season, body fat is no longer our overriding concern. So we'll put an upper limit and we'll say, you can do whatever you need to do as long as your body fat doesn't cross and depending on the body type, the age of the athlete, et cetera, we'll put a number. Let's say it's 15%. They can mass their way up to 15%, but the quicker they get to 15%, the quicker they're slowing down, the slower they get to 15%, the better. So it, I guess is vaguely a similar approach, but at the end of the day, it's not this spastic cycles. It's simply an upper and lower limit. Why would you want to be any lower than say 10% in the off season? Why would you want to be any fatter than 15%? It's done. Now you've got an upper and lower limit and you just bounce in between there. Accruing lean mass is an entirely different animal, a separate animal anyway, if not different, it's a separate animal. Gotcha. And kind of to transition a little bit back to dieting here. So if someone is going through a phase to where they're, you know, 
limiting how much fat they're eating, do you think that the quality of that fat matters a little bit more? And, you know, quality is a little subjective, but what what do you think about that? Um, well, there's a whole lot of subjective there. One, the experts don't agree even on what is a proper fat ratio percentages. There's a ton of argument. Right. Most people fall back to the bullshit one third saturated, one third, you know, polyunsaturated, one third saturated, you know, kind of that. And there happens to be three kinds, so maybe that makes some sense. But I, to, to the best of my understanding, there's no real good research proving that one variety or demographic of fat is superior to another. Most people, especially the natural assholes, latch on to this idea that fat's where your hormones come from, which is only vaguely true, but even if we run with that, that would mean the saturated fat part. Hmm. So again, it, it, you know, it co probably comes down to what is your concept of health? Is it inflammation considerations? Is it hormonal considerations? What exactly are you dialing in as that's the thing I'm identifying as health? And that would probably determine what you prioritize. Right. But to sweep all of that aside, and this is one of the reasons why I like the variety of diet I like, is because it's self-correcting. If you minimize your protein to a sensible number, two to three grams per kilogram, and you get that protein from sensible sources, beef, fish, poultry, possibly beans, strangely, what falls out of that is about a commensurate one gram per kilogram of fat, and it's approximately 50% saturated and 50% unsaturated, which is shockingly close to what everybody wants to agree on. Mm -hmm. I don't find it a coincidence that working from the top down gets the bottom stuff right. Right, so your approach is more so, if you're eating you know, a lot of quality proteins, the fat part kind of takes care of itself. Absolutely. And this okay. idea of like adding fat to a diet, to me, that's just ludicrous. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that one. And yeah, it's just ludicrous. And you mentioned that fats, they could have different roles in hormone production and different things like that in different types of fats. Would you almost say that there's a certain type of fat that someone may want to preferentially have for body composition purposes while maybe if they're going through like say a fat loss phase and their fats are pretty dang restrictive do you think there's a certain type of fats you think they might want to keep in for that sort of thing that is absolutely not my area of expertise mm. again largely because i work with drug using athletes we get our hormones from a bottle we don't really care about that you know, oxidative pathway, turning them into cholesterol to pregnenolone to, you know, all the things that they become. It's right. just not really happening. Mm -hmm. So it's not where I've focused. Now, people that I am close to do focus on that. Guys like Lyle McDonald, for instance, mm -hmm. could talk you to death on that topic. And a very capsule version is, he would say, I suspect, I don't want to completely speak for him because that's never good business, but I've had enough conversations that I think I could intimate. He would say, one, it's not that big of a deal, and two, if you want to make it a big deal, begin to prioritize saturated fats when you're in the truly restrictive zones. And to be fair, I would agree with that, but again, I would agree with that because if you're really in that calorie-restricted zone, you're going to be one of focusing on flesh proteins, which strangely have the saturated fat. Right. You know, if you're really on that restricted a diet, you shouldn't be living on soybeans. Mm -hmm. And if you are at the point to where you have to restrict that much, it's probably not going to be for that long of a period of time. Well, at Agreed. least hopefully. So hopefully then it matters even less what kind of type of fat you have. Agreed. Cool. And kind of the next thing that I want to touch on is, you know, some people will kind of spout off about, oh, let's boost our hormones naturally and do things like that. And I'm just curious, 
if somebody happened to go from kind of the lower range of in, but still within normal for like testosterone levels and things like that, and somehow kind of naturally got up to that that higher range, but still within the normal ranges, do you think that that could have a significant effect on body composition outcomes? Well, again, I'm not exactly attacking you, but how many people walk around hypotestosterone? They have low T, and they go to the doctor and like, oh, I feel like shit, my dick doesn't get hard, I can't perform at the gym, and then they get a 100 milligram a week shot of testosterone, which raises them to the mid-range of the therapeutic index, and suddenly they're a new person. And they're a porn star in bed, and they're going to the gym, and everything's different. Yeah, it, the answer's obvious. Yes. And, and it shouldn't even the, – the part that offends me about that is why is that a question? Are there people really pondering that as a question? If I raise my testosterone, will I get bigger and stronger? Is that a question that exists in sane people's minds? Well, I think the question is more so – how much of a increase could you expect by trying to do some things just as a natural person? Well, I have no idea. I don't know natural people. I don't know who they are. I don't know what they do. I don't condone what they do. I have no idea. From a pharmacological point of view, if you raise somebody to the high end of the reference range of testosterone, you improve their performance. How they would do that naturally, I have no idea. Nor, nor more importantly, nor do I care. Okay. Like I, I don't. The, we have drugs that work just fine. Why would you try and farm weird and African herbs or something to accomplish what literally drug technology from the 1930s has already accomplished? Right. But I think the argument against that might be that there could potentially be some negative side effects to taking certain well, things. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because here here's an interesting fact that all the natural wits fail to consider never mind the whole bought it in a bottle active injecting all that okay take that out of your mind and you say i put 100 milligrams of testosterone into my bloodstream does your body know where that came from does your body have any ability to determine that that was not manufactured in-house probably not probably not so, with that very simple point of logic, you could say, if I managed to discover some goofy fuck natural modality that raised my testosterone, it would behave exactly the same as if I took it exogenously. Therefore, the idea that some natural modality is therefore better or safer or skirts the health effects, no. Again, Clear your mind. I know it's a separate hormone, but think about this. Growth hormone, okay? There are a few unfortunate people born every decade with pituitary tumors. They get a growth hormone disorder, and they turn into homunculus giants. They get something you know, called acromegalia. They literally mm -hmm. look like Andre the Giant. Their body made it. It was natural. Why are they still getting side effects? Because exposure to super physiologic amounts generates those results regardless of how you got it. That's Again, that's just natural people wanting to whine about being natural and not having enough hair on their parts to actually take drugs. Right. I, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Like, at some point, whether you increase your testosterone via reducing stress levels and doing things like that, or by taking it exogenously, kind of doing the same thing. Uh, consequence is exactly the same, including the results. The consequence is exactly the same. Right. And, you know, some, some people will argue that naturals shouldn't take any advice whatsoever from people that are kind of more enhanced or work with enhanced people do you have any, any thoughts on that one? Well, this, th there's a whole bunch of answers there hiding there. But the first answer is, on a regular basis, no, I don't have thoughts on that because, quite fairly, I, I don't think about naturals. I don't know who they are. I don't know what they do. I don't know where they live. Um, 
you know, it, it, it's, you know, it's like talking about Martians. Like I, I you, you could tell me anything and I'd, I'd have to believe you cause I don't fucking know. Mm-hmm. So if you're taking me to task at this moment from an intellectual point of view, I would probably view it much like race car driving. Race car drivers are very good at driving race cars, but they're probably not the people I would ask to teach me how to drive Mm -hmm. because their skill is fairly niche at going 200 miles an hour and only making left turns. I'm going to be driving in a city at slower speeds and parallel parking. So even though there's so many shared characteristics, my suspicion is, no, they don't really have a lot to do with one another and probably don't have a lot of value. Okay. I I think that makes sense as well. But I I still think that there can be some value to be taken from people that are more advanced that kind of go over training principles and nutrition principles and things like that that can still be applied to other people. Would you agree with that? See, there's a funny line there. Whether you're using drugs or not, human physiology doesn't change. Body still runs on glucose, still turns it into ATP, all that. But what does change is the margins by such orders of magnitude that it really doesn't, even though it's the same in biochemistry, the application is so radically different that no, it probably doesn't have a lot to do with a lot. You know, that's one of the reasons why the, high, the, the, the natural crowd gets their panties so bunched up about high-carb massing. Part of the reason why it's so alien to them is because they're small. They have no mass. So the highest amount of carbs they could possibly consume is what I eat for breakfast because they're small. So again, it's 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 not that the rules have changed. It's just it's like it, again, it's like race car driving. Like regular cars have regular size engines, and you expect certain performance and fuel economy and what have you. Well, if you quadruple that to a race car, guess what? The profile is a lot different. The way you take care of it is a lot different. It, it's just different. Mm-hmm. Even though it operates on exactly the same fundamental systems, you know, there's little spinny parts, pistons go up and down, fuel explodes, same an engine, but yet it's not. Right. I, okay. I think that makes sense, and I guess I'm just kind of curious to where is is the reason you kind of enjoy working with the more enhanced population? Is it just because it's more more fun or more? more cool to see some of these larger magnitudes of effect from certain things that you're doing with them or what's kind of your reasoning behind that in truth i probably don't have a reason it's not like i sat up one night you know in 1980 like you know, dreaming like oh i'm gonna be a drug guru like n- no i got to where i am by wholly selfish modalities I wanted to perform a certain way. I pursued the necessary education and application to do it. Because of that, I've surrounded myself with like-minded people, and I've just essentially immersed myself in that niche. And so, you know, if I need to know this, you know, complement of drug use, then I need the, com- the associated nutrition and the associated training and the associated training partner and so on and so on. And so it's to the point where, you know, I've kind of started my own country on a separate island somewhere because I, I just really surrounded myself with the separate people. Right. So it- and now the difference, if I may, I didn't mean to cut you off, but the difference, if I may, is... I don't cross pollinate and pretend like I have some grand thing success scheme to sell to naturals. I, I rather tell them the opposite. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not, you know, you, I don't want to throw him under the bus, but you know, you know, John Meadows is a great example. Like he's very open about his drug use, but yet he's really pedantic that he can help naturals. And I'm, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's true. I don't want to take him to task, but I'm pretty smart, I think. 
<laughs> and I don't feel really good pontificating about natural sports for what that's worth. Yeah, I, I think that's a very respectable approach to have on it to where you're kind of, you know, I'm just going to stay in my lane here of what I know I know and kind of working with naturals is kind of a different deal and you're not trying to sell them stuff. And, you know, a lot of people could leverage their the way they look or the way they perform based on being a little bit more enhanced. And a lot of people do do that and tell naturals that it all applies. So I kind of like your approach to that. I, I appreciate that. But again, let me be clear. I didn't like sit home and formulate this. It's just, you know, I have some pretty significant personality defects and I, I'm who <laughs> I am. And I, I just don't really have another version. Like, I think there are people that actually believe this persona that I put forward as some sort of marketing scheme. Like, oh, he's the, the crazy guy, you know, and it, maybe I am, but it, it's not a persona. It's, I get out of fucking bed like this. This is who I am. Right. And I, I think you're just being who you are. There's nothing wrong with that. And I'd be interested if there's any, with your, the population you work with, is there anything kind of across that population that you still find kind of holds them back a little bit from progressing? Commitment. A hundred percent. You, if you look again, I'm not throwing anyone else under the bus. I understand people's reservations about health, humanity, what have you. Mm -hmm. Having said that, if you look at the truly elite success people, just run down names that are pretty obvious. You're not throwing anyone under the bus. Ronnie Coleman, uh, Eddie Hall, Think of those kind of names. What do they all have in common? 100% unadulterated commitment. If they die, they die. That's not their goal, but they know it's a consequence. They're going to do what they need to do. Most people have an upper limit that they are not comfortable crossing, and that's what holds them back. And, and I'm not, believe me, I'm not behind the scenes like trying to push them. I'm just pointing out that if you tell me that's where we have to stop, then that's where where it stops. Like you can't, you know, you don't keep making magic progress if you're not willing to go past the magic point. Mm -hmm. And I think I see this sometimes to where people are like, okay, how do I make maximal gains while training three days a week, while only being in the gym for an hour, while mm -hmm. only eating 100 grams of protein? How, how do I get maximal gains? And it's like, I don't think you can, man. Well, you can get maximal to those conditions, right. but is that maximal compared to what you or someone else could do as a trainer? No, of course not. And I guess the, the next place I'd like to go with this is you do coach Dr. Mike Isertel, and I'd be interested if, if you have any, any good stories about coaching him or what, what it's like kind of coaching him. Um... Well, it's, it's really, I mean, especially in light of who I am and what I do, it's not really good business to talk about a client. But on that concept of commitment, I actually can give you a little bit of an in, insight into the Dr. Mike persona. First of all, the idea that I coach him is probably not fair. He's a PhD. He's wicked smart. <laughs> By the way, those two aren't necessarily you know, as close as you might assume. He's yeah. both a PhD and wicked smart. He's got a lifetime of experience. He's been doing this forever. Yes, I am on paper his coach. In reality, what I am is a consultant with a lifetime of experience in my particular niche, okay? He does his own training. By and large, he does his own diet. I will chime in and say, if this is going to happen over on this page, we might want to you know, juice this up, change that. You might want more calories, you know, but it's really just a, an adjustment of an existing paradigm. So I wouldn't go so bold as to say I coach him. I consult him and I offer him a perspective based on a lifetime of experience. That said, the contest that Mike did uh, 18 months ago or so was by no means his best performance performance certainly not I mean, it may, may have been his best performance but it was not as good as it should have been nor was it as good as it could have been but in preparation for that contest we were going over his diet and how he was performing he lives a couple hundred miles from me so we don't see each other every day 
And um, I was pressing him because a couple of things were not turning out quite the way I had anticipated. So I was pressing him, you know, Mike, you know, how, how many times did you miss your calorie mark? How many times did you do this? And he hemmed and he hauled and he was sheepish and he didn't want to answer. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, like he's you know, he's been eating fucking donuts or, you know, I, I, that's what I assumed. And then he finally he finally he's like, all right, let me get my journal. And he starts. I hear pages turn in and, and he goes, well, Wednesday, the 27th at 2 p.m., uh, I had a. I had a, 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 a second, I had a second English muffin. <laughs> and that, that was it. And then he turns the page and he's like, and, and it, and at 9 PM on the 20, whatever, he's like, um, I, I had juice. Like, like the, 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 these were like, this was like, this was weighing on his soul. He didn't <laughs> want to tell me that he had accidentally had a, a, an extra English muffin and a glass of juice in a week. <laughs> Jeez. So he's definitely the the type that's going to be very strict and definitely have his P's and Q's in line. Unquestionably. Unquestionably. My, Mike is a special case on many levels. Um, again, I don't want to throw him under the bus, but Mike is well-funded. Mike is able to, you know, have meals made for him, you know, food prep, that sort of thing. So literally it's, you know, he and I agree on something – it gets faxed somewhere and it manifests in his refrigerator and he literally just has to, you know, grab the one marked Monday and eat it. Excuse me. So it's, you know, I almost said it's a special case, but the reality is it's not a special case. That's what the elite looks like. If you followed around, you know, Jay Cutler or whoever, you would see a very similar paradigm in play. Yeah, and I would say even even in the natural realm, to be elite, you'll see a similar mindset to where like Steve Hall is the example that I think of. The dude trains six days a week, twice a day, and he's talked about before that it doesn't even cross his mind to go off his macros or to yeah. to miscount something. It's just total commitment. Yeah. Yep, and that's, you know, to be at those elite levels, that's probably about what it takes. I suspect that it's the only option. Yes. There are a few random idiots that, you know, just have such exceptional genetics. And usually that little genetics rabbit ears is really just drug response. Mm -hmm. there, there are a couple of those idiots that perform well for a period of time, but they're never the ones with the lifelong careers. Yeah. And you know, that kind of brings up, Another potentially interesting question is drug response. And isn't there, like, I, I know almost nothing about drug responses and stuff like that, but isn't there quite different intra-individual variability in how someone responds to testosterone and exogenous things like that? Absolutely. Um, not only that, but it's a slightly separate subject, but yet not. Um, Dan Duchesne, who was kind of the original, you know, steroid guru, a guy who I spent a lot of time studying behind, um, was absolutely convinced that the major differential between almost and success stories was insulin sensitivity, genetically predetermined insulin sensitivity. Um, and of course, I believe he's also was right but that was only the tip of a much bigger iceberg. The two major factors in modern bodybuilding, in my opinion, if you roll back the hands of time to, I almost said pre-drug era, but the reality is that's a whole separate argument. You know, people have this douchebag belief that, you know, Steve Reeves, you know, didn't use drugs or couldn't have used drugs. That's fairy tale, boys and girls. Testosterone has been a commercial, keyword, commercial product since 1940 1940 oh. everybody after 1940 and the truth truth is it was actually a product before that it was very niche and specific but there were people even before 1940 that had access to testosterone so that's a whole separate thing but <laughs> in the era of steve reeves and what have you the concept of genetics was you know, six foot tall, wide shoulders, full calves, long muscle bellies, etc. In modern bodybuilding, 
Genetics is basically two things. Drug response and drug survivability. Hmm. How many bodybuilders can you think of that sprung up, were amazing, and then rather quickly retired? Well, trust me, they didn't get tired of being famous or wealthy. They got fucking sick. Their body could not tolerate the abuse of drug use. Gotcha. So the couple of the biggest factors for those athletes is how well they can actually tolerate those higher doses of drugs and how they respond to those drugs. And would you say that athletes that have a high response to lower amounts of drugs can potentially go a little bit further in that kind of realm? You know, that's a fun, that you're not the first person to ask me that. And obviously lower dosings probably means, you know, lower costs, lower accessibility. There's a lot of things that suddenly makes their life easier. It's like the person that doesn't need to eat as much. There's, there's a lot of benefits to that. Mm -hmm. However, doing what I do for a living, I look at blood work hours a day, pretty much every day. My armchair, maybe not even armchair, maybe a little above armchair at this point, correlation is typically the people that respond really well also are pretty responsive to the negatives. People that can get away with very low doses also see elevations in cholesterol and you know drop in HDL and all that stuff. And the other side of the coin is people that can take a pretty significant dose and not get response, they also don't seem to get a lot of side effects. Okay, so it kind of works itself out to where the more sensitive you are to the drug, the more sensitive you might be to the adverse effects of that as well. That's correct. That seems to be correct. Now, me again, I know right now there's like some Bayesian <laughs> bodybuilding idiot like you know, gnashing his teeth. No, I don't have a research paper that supports that. You know why? Because they don't do research on drug users. <laughs> right. Uh, and kind of the, this question's going to be quite off the cuff here, and I, I don't know if you really looked into this a whole lot, but the, the topic of SARMs is becoming quite popular as of late. Would you, do you have any thoughts on whether that's like efficacious thing for people or, or what, what's kind of going on there? And again, I, I know like nothing about SARMs. Well, it, it, that really depends on how, who's asking the question. I, 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 and I don't mean to, you know, I don't mean to, 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 to dodge the question, but mm -hmm. they are not by definition steroids, fair and accurate. However, they physiologically accomplish the same thing as steroids. That's kind of important. There's this douchebag belief among the naturals that, well, I'm not taking steroids. I'm taking SARMs. I'm not taking steroids. You're taking a drug to artificially express protein. Not only are you taking a drug to artificially express protein, but it's a drug that binds to the exact same receptor, tricks the body into thinking you're taking a steroid to express the protein. So from an ethics point of view, you're taking steroids. You're certainly taking a drug. That aside, SARMs will almost certainly be an enormous benefit to clinical medicine. They will probably occupy the role that it was hoped steroids would fill. Burn patients, children, geriatrics, women. There's a lot of places where a non-masculinizing anabolic substance could be enormously benefit. You know, people with immune dif dysfunction, mm -hmm. HIV, all kinds of places, possibly even diabetes. There's a load of places where that could be valuable. As far as their application in sports, I'm more than a little suspect that they really have much of a role for a bunch of reasons. One, steroids work, work really well. They're cheap, they're accessible, they're very well understood. There's really not a lot of reason to look for another modality. You know, it's not like everyone's walking around like, oh, those goddamn steroids. If I, if I just had something else, <laughs> no, no, that's really not going on. It, no. In a vague sense, SARMs are a superior drug 
And that very superiority makes them somewhat inferior to athletes. I know that sounds ridiculous. I'll explain. The purpose of a truly anabolic drug, when organic chemists tried to create high-quality anabolics in the 50s, primabolin, their goal, literally, and in print, like they, this is, was their published goal, was to create a drug with anabolic properties and as little or no masculinizing properties as possible. Fair enough? Okay. When an athlete takes testosterone, trenbolone, whatever, most, if eh, maybe not most, but a measurable portion of what they're considering the effects are actually side effects. And from a chemistry point of view, unwanted side effects. Organic chemists from the 1960s did not really care if you got an erection. They didn't really care if you got aggressive. They really didn't care if the texture of your muscle changed. They were trying to get muscle protein expression. Most of what steroid users prize from steroids, it's actually side effects. How many times do you hear, well, maybe you don't because you don't live in the world of, but I do. <laughs> How many times have I heard bodybuilder X, Y, or Z say, oh, I took primabolin, but I, I couldn't, it, I didn't feel like it was working. Face, you don't feel muscle growth. Muscle growth doesn't feel like anything. The, you, you, uh, uh, there's legions of naturals out there that don't feel like anything. You know why? Because they're not taking anything! <laughs> so my point is, SARMs are almost certainly going to be disappointing to actual drug users because they're accustomed to this complement of secondary effects, aggression, water retention, etc. SARMs by design are not going to do that and therefore leave a gap. Okay. And this might have been the, the better place to start, but how, how are SARMs kind of working differently than testosterone on kind of like a physiological level? Well, they don't work differently. That's the key. That's the, that's the whole point. They don't work differently. That's a, that's a delusion. We'll use an analogy that's actually wrong, but it's, it's okay for this kind of conversation. You hear this kind of nursery rhyme sing song that, you know, there's drug in the blood and it's like a key and it fits into the lock that is the receptor. And then there's reception and whatever ensues. In this case, muscle growth. So you have an androgen receptor, which is vaguely analogous to a lock. And if you put a non-androgen in it, you try to put adrenaline in there or something, it doesn't fit. Key doesn't fit in a lock. Nothing happens. You put testosterone in there, the lock opens. Things that are patterned directly after testosterone, 19 nor testosterone, dianabol, you know, trenbolone, et cetera, they're sufficiently like testosterone that they'll fit in that lock. Mm -hmm. pretty straightforward but all anabolic steroids have their action at that lock no others that one okay SARMs selective androgen receptor modulators are an entirely different species of molecule they do not look like anabolic steroids the best analogy you can think of is they are like a skeleton key that is able to fit in that receptor despite not actually being the proper key. Yeah. But they still bind to that receptor, activate that receptor, and send a message very similar to whether it was testosterone, nandrolone, boldenone, trembolone, et cetera. That idea that they work different is horse shit. It's people that haven't taken the time to Wikipedia what they are. Gotcha. So the outcome is like the same, but since they are, since they, well, the outcome may not be the same because you don't get the side effects. So since they well, are, that's not entirely elucidated. You don't necessarily get the same side effects, but first of all, there's no drug without side effects. Like literally every aspirin, anything has side right. effects. Secondly, even though SARMs are not sex hormones, they are all the research is showing that they do cause androgen suppression, mm. which is a side effect. 
They all yeah. have some influence on cholesterol, which is a side effect. Yes, they don't cause the aggression. They don't cause as much water retention. They don't cause a number of other side effects, but that's not, those might not even be the dangerous ones. Right. So to me, it sounds like they're kind of a little bit less studied and I feel like they could almost oh, yeah. have, new. they could almost have other side effects that people aren't even considering outside of testosterone. Keep, keep in mind, you know, testosterone has been identified since the 1880s. 1880s. It was first synthesized in a lab in the 30s. It was commercially available in the 40s. We are talking about a product that is literally 100 years old. SARMs might be 20 years old. Big difference. Yeah, gotcha. Well, I know that definitely educates me quite a bit on SARMs and the differences there. So I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I think that's about all the time we have today. Where, where, <laughs> where, where can people find you, learn more about you, learn your stuff, things like that? Uh, uh, t tell them to go talk to Steve Hall. <laughs> <laughs> talk to Steve Hall. Gotcha. Well, I'll, I'll be sure to do that. Go check him out at revivestronger.com. He's a, he's a good guy, and he knows naturally shit, so talk to him. All right. Well, I will make sure to send them that way. Well, th thank you so much for coming on today, Broderick. Of course. Thank you so much for listening, Ed. I know Broderick didn't say it, but you can still find his stuff at teameevilgsp.com. You can find my stuff at ryanjsolomon.com. I hope you enjoyed this discussion, that you took some away from it, that it entertained you a little bit. But that's all I got for this one. I'll see you in that next one.